Joining me to review some of the week's big stories is Lawrence Amadi, partner and head tech assurance, KPMG Nigeria. He has more than 20 years of experience with tech advisory, serving clients in the technology, media and telecom space, amongst others. He's also a Chelsea football club fan. <laughs> I thought, I'm sure you thought I wouldn't say that. You, you had to go there. <laughs> yes, I had to. I had to. So great to have you on the show. Thank you. Rebecca. I think it's your first time. So the story I'd like us to look at is the IMF forecast on the UK economy. And of course, we've seen a couple of central bank rate rises over the past few days. What's the implication of all this for the UK? So I'd say, first of all, the pandemic has really reset the entire world's growth trajectory. Uh, we see, uh, you know, major cuts. Nigeria has some ambitions. Globally, there were ambitions, but all of those have been stepped down. Um, uh, China is picking up pace, but in the U.S. and in the U.K., they are being really conservative because we can also see their debt profile going up. And the only way you curb debt is to actually manage interest rates. So this is the reason why the U.S. Uh, Fed, you know, they, they've, they've grown this by... 0.25 uh, you know, percent, which is like a 25 basis points. In the UK, they also are looking at this and saying, look, we've, we've got to move. So they've hiked from 3.5 to 4 percent. That's a whopping 50 basis points right there. Mm. And these are all measures to just sort of manage, uh, you know, how they release cash into the economy. Yeah. Uh, amongst and, other and, things. But is there a risk that they may now be going too far, especially given now that the IMF is forecasting potential recession in the UK economy? Is this really going way too out and curbing consumer spending and sentiments? Well, you could actually argue, uh, you know, along those lines. Uh, I think essentially it's uh, we've got to manage expectations because they've got to look at the citizenry. They look at the palliative packages they've created for their, for their respective citizens. Uh, you know, look at the, the growth projections they put uh, out there. And they've got to say, look, we've got to manage expectations. Uh, the rest of the world look up to them for, for their own projections. So when these basis points change on interest rates, uh, euro bonds, uh, you know, euro bonds transactions and the likes yeah. all get affected because these, um, you know, packages all get repriced. And it, it cascades down to the rest of the world. Of course it does. And Christine Lagarde, actually, ECB chief, did mention that rate rises would continue. But let's look at Nigeria now. Yemi Oshibajo commenting still on the cashless economy, which we've all been talking about for weeks and months, saying that it's, it's part of measures to curb illicit election financing and mop up excess liquidity, of course, in the economy. What are your thoughts on this whole government plan around the cashless economy? How well is the government really doing? So I'll start off by saying for the first time, You'd, you'd agree that cash is king. Yes. When you look at what's going on around uh, with the banks and the struggles. Um, and I, I think, back to the question, totally agree with the vice president. Okay. We've got to head towards a cashless um, economy without a doubt. Uh, this is the reason why agency banking has become a big deal. Uh, this is why POSs are growing uh, in leaps and bounds. Uh, we've moved from about 88,000 plus agency banks uh, in 2018. So about 1.4 million agency banks today. Mm. And, you know, that, that's a phenomenal number. Yeah. And when you look at who are the drivers, the, the big banks are driving this, all pay and other players are driving this. And we expect that this should potentially help us manage how we then, you know, drive financial inclusion in Nigeria. Mm. Yes, but looking at everything that's happening now with the new Naira redesign, the notes, the deadlines being set, all the various policies, this new Afrigo card that's coming up, it seems like the government is moving at a much faster pace than the citizenry is ready to adapt to. I mean, what are the longer term implications? Is there a risk that those right at the bottom of the pyramid will ultimately be left behind if they're not fully included in the financial system? So, another good question. I'll just say we, we are gathering data as a country. Mm. And that data gathering, you know, you, you got to look at the NIN, you got to look at the BVN. That's the national identification number. Correct. Yeah. The BVN, uh, you know, platform. And there's a drive to sort of consolidate all of those. Yeah. Uh, wh where am I going to? If we continue to promote, um, you know, the cashless economy, then things like, you know, USSD banking, should actually gain more traction mm -hmm. and this helps everybody and to do ussd banking you know is essentially you just using uh you know a star triple digit number hash to do a transaction yes that enables transfers 
uh, you know, and help us, you know, it, it helps Nigeria move quicker towards closing that gap. Mm. Now, there's still the education components we've got to consider. So the uneducated few or the or uneducated masses might still struggle to catch on. So yes, you're right. We may be moving faster than the average Nigerian citizen, but maybe it's now you and I to educate our grandparents and and parents to you know to, to get on to get on board because yeah. this train is already you know yeah. uh, in obviously motion. a lot more needs to be done in terms of spreading the awareness. So. Really exciting story, and I know you're an ICT guy to the core. Starlink is in Nigeria, you know, and I'm surprised this development is not getting as much publicity. This seems to be subsumed by the whole cashless economy issues. But, I mean, this is an internet service, in my mind, that could revolutionize internet service provision in Nigeria. What are your thoughts? So, very interesting one. Uh, we all know Elon Musk uh, is a very bullish guy. Uh, he wants to take over the world, essentially, <laughs> with his mindset. And space. Uh, and space, actually. <laughs> yeah. so, so he rolls out this um, very innovative internet service pro provision, uh, launched in space, uh, beaming from, from satellites you know, out of space. Um, but coming to Nigeria, we're the 47th country that Elon Musk is coming to. But the uh, first in Africa. First Africa. in Africa. Yeah. Um, the price, the, pri the entry point will always be the challenge. Uh, you, the average Nigerian will have to spend about 300,000 naira to buy the device or the equipment. And then monthly subscription is about $41 plus, uh, which is almost 20,000 naira yeah. uh, monthly. Um, we are in an era it's where... It's actually more. It's, it's almost 30,000. Ah, yeah. So you've got to then think about how the average Nigerian would afford this. So, you know, is this product for... The HNIs and, and the higher end people, mm. uh, you know, I mean, time will tell. And, and yeah, that's an interesting point around affordability. But in terms of other internet service providers, is this going to rock the boat a bit? And we're going to see more efficiency in service provision? It certainly will rock the boat mm. because um, I expect that some people, if they experience this, uh, I haven't subscribed yet, but if they experience this and they find, you know, faster speed, uh, it gives them what they're looking for, potentially it's going to disrupt the market. Yeah. Interesting point. And still within the sort of telecoms, telco space, MTN, mm. you know, trailblazer, I guess you'd argue, two trillion naira in revenues, um, profitability up. Clearly, telecoms is one of the biggest boom factors for growth in this economy. What, how do you assess this latest results? 100% spot on, uh, Rolake. So if I look at um, the contribution to the GDP, you know, they do, they've done 14%. They've done almost 15% uh, in, in the last quarter of 2022. Uh, they will keep contributing to the economy. Uh, MTN, you know, uh, a, a, a favorite, you know, in, you know, for a lot of Nigerians, uh, today have about 80 million subscribers. 80 million. 80 million. Wow. Eight zero. Mm. So uh, 80 million. They, they probably closed 2022 at about 78 million. Uh, 80 million today, approximately active subscribers. Uh, you know, that is almost hitting 50 percent of Nigeria's population. Uh, you know, and they took risks. You, you probably might wonder, how did they do this? They took risks. They, they came into the market. They were bullish. They took risks. They were not the first to come into the country, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, they came and they said, look, we're committed to this market, invested, and I think they're reaping the rewards. Clearly reaping the rewards. And what is your assessment of service provision generally across the telecoms world? Because, you know, you hear complaints every day. Are we doing better than we did two years ago? Okay, so I think I've got to weave in the 5G evolution right. into this response. Sure. Uh, very recently, they've switched on 5G services across the country. Mm. Now, some people are saying we're seeing better connection. Some are saying we don't see the difference. And some are saying, look, we're struggling completely. It looks like um, the 5G upgrade may have, um, you know, slowed things down a bit. Uh, so I think uh, quality of service will still continue to remain a major factor for all telcos in, in Nigeria. Yeah, indeed. So great speaking to you, Lawrence Amadi. Look forward to talking more tech and ICT stories, and of course, maybe exchanging football stories as well. <laughs>